What tats? He hasn't told me he's got tats. Mate, he's got a full sleeve going there. Can I lift up the old... So, say, no, say, no, say, a, they, say they give the potty, mate. It was a That's stupid good 18 or 20-year-old <laughs> decision where yeah. mate was a tattoo. So hang on, hang on, hang on. We're going to save this for the podcast. What do you get when a legless lad and a blind bloke walk into a bar? A couple of mates on a mission to challenge what it means to be tough. Right, oh, welcome back to another episode of Talking Tough, proudly brought to you by Ski for Life. And as always, we're here to have a chat with the average Joe. We're here to have a laugh, and we are here to redefine what it means to be tough. Legless? Yes. How Thank are you, you brother? Blinder. Yeah, I'm really good, mate. Yeah, I'm really good. It's been What's a... been going on? Oh, look, it's been uh, an interesting old week. Um, I, uh, I, had, I had one particular instru- interesting circumstance and um, this, this happened. Tell me. I'm all ears. Uh, I was I'm wa- not all eyes, but I'm all ears. I was walking, <laughs> uh, yeah, I was walking down the um, – we decided to go for a walk, family walk. So I've got a little, uh, you know, one-year-old, almost one-year-old little that. boy uh, walking along, went to the local park. And as, as you know, as everyone knows, got no legs. I, I, I wear shorts all the time. Mm. But I went down the park this particular um, afternoon with my wife and we bumped into one of our friends, but as I walked across the park, I didn't know this, but she noticed that someone that was sitting in the park all of a sudden got their camera out and they mm. started filming me walking. Filming and, you? And I didn't know at the time. We walked off. Did uh, you sign afterwards. a consent form? Well, I didn't. And we wo- <laughs> I, did, I didn't. Uh, and uh, I, didn't, I didn't know this was happening. And then later on, um, yeah, sort of we walked off to another part of our neighbourhood and she said there was a guy that actually – you know, was filming you walking around. And I'm like, really? Where was I? I was got kind of fired up. I'm like, who is this guy? Like, let's, like a zoo know, animal. Got me re- yeah, it made me feel a little bit like I was a zoo animal. So that was an interesting sort of time. I mean, you we- could, with those legs and the fact that you can jack your height up to whatever you want, Yeah, you could be a giraffe. Well, I but could it's still be. not the point. I, I, I've, I've got that to be honest with you, you though. Like, it's, um, it's an interesting one. Like, most of the time I'm totally aware that people are looking and staring at, at you know, someone with no legs. That's perfectly fine. But getting your phone out and filming it, is that is that... A bit over the top, mate. I don't think it's acceptable. Yeah. <laughs> I'll, I'll be pretty blunt about bit it. Crazy, but um, yeah, that was my week. But um, it, as as always, we are uh, we're back with talking tough for another episode, and I'm really excited about this episode oh, yeah? because we have the most uh, wonderful guest. I um don't know a lot a lot about um, our guest today, but um, I have read uh, some things, so it's all uh, new, and I can't wait to to dive deep uh, into his story and. Uh, get a bit of insights into a young man that um, knows a hell of a lot about what it means to be tough. Yeah, absolutely, mate. I am pumped as well. I have uh, met Josh a couple of times. Josh Robson, look, if I was going to give uh, give you a pump up, give you a spiel, give you an intro, I would put it pretty simply as the fact that he aligns pretty perfectly with the, the type of people that we have on this potty and that is literally – the average Joe. Uh, he, I'm sure you'll tell us all about about it, mate. But you're a construction worker. Uh, probably the non-average bit is uh, also an Iron Man. Uh, but mate, yeah. thanks so much for being here. Ah, thanks for having me. It's super cool to be here with you both and watching you bounce off each other. Straight <laughs> off the bat, mate. You're wearing a shirt. Uh, we're yes. going to be. Oh, I'm glad he's wearing a shirt. Yeah. Thank you, Mike. You're going to be discussing <laughs> it. But underneath that shirt, Josh has got a hell of a lot of uh, artwork going on. Talk about talk us through that, Josh. Um, um, you got a full sleeve going on there. Lift it up a bit, a show us of, What's going on there? A lot of stupid teenage uh, choices. <laughs> so <laughs> the first How old are you now? How old are you? I'm now 31. 31. And at what age did you get this full sleeve that tattoo? Was about 21. 21. 20, 21 okay. it started. So. Any regrets? Yeah, just if you're, if you're out there thinking about getting a tattoo, maybe just think about being 31 and then being on a podcast and the opening question is, what about your tattoos? So, Lucky it's a podcast, yeah, mate. Yeah, that's it, they can't see them. So a lot but of silly In all seriousness, I can't see them. So you, you are going to have to tell me yeah, what they tell are. Yeah, tell us what they are. Um, they're just a few patterns that were made up by a mate on the yeah. spot and we just ran with it. Literally, that's what it is. So, Super meaningful. So your mate just literally drew it up. Drew it on with highlighters and textures and then just coloured went it to in. A, went to a tattooist yep. and then said, hey, my mate's been scribbling on my arm. No, so he was the tattooist. Oh, he was the tattooist. So he so. was the tattooist. He right. wanted some uh, practice. Yep. And then, yeah, just the way we went. And then once we had a sort of a few patterns going on, we grabbed those patterns and just transferred them around and it yeah. created the, the maze I have on my arm, which I... Do have a few regrets about. Well, I'm uh, going to picture you without it because you got regrets. Because <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> I haven't pictured you with tats yet. So in my head, you don't have tats. But, mate, to kick off, uh, again, thanks so much for being here. But we love to kick off every single episode with understanding what your definition of tough was when you were growing up. What did tough mean to you? 
as a little kid? Uh, tough as a little kid was just how hard you could work. Um, I always wanted to be a hard worker and work harder than the bloke next to me. Um, and it was just about, you know, not crying, not being a sook um, and just sort of if, if you were, were sad or had any issues, you just got on with life. Yeah. It was quite simply that's what it was and, and if you're sick, you go to work. If you you know, <laughs> it's just quite simply the old tradie brought up on a farm, you just – you get on with life. It's yeah. that simple. Get over it. Um, Does that come from your parents? I think it just comes from being – we had sort of a farming background. It's yeah. just all the old farmers and horse riders. Did a lot of horse riding as a young kid. Yeah. Um, so it's just – that's just the mentality we had. Mm. So yeah. Whereabouts did you grow up, Josh? Which was uh, Back of Smarsh, okay. just west of Melbourne. So, yeah. yeah, out on 25 acres there and – Played polo cross as a as a kid, which is look, not polo; it's lacrosse on horseback, and okay. sort of that's. I guess that's where the mentality comes from because you're always out riding your horse in the many in the cold fall, many falls. Yeah, I had a lot of falls. Mate, you'd have to yeah. be tough to play a sport <laughs> a like that. Of, it's yeah, it was a good sport. It, yeah. it, it shaped it shaped who I am today. Yeah. Um, I wouldn't change it for the world. So, so tell us yeah. about growing up. Tell us about Josh's whippersnapper. What was what was life like? <laughs> life um, was. Highs um, and lows. Yeah, there's a lot of thoughts that come to mind, but yeah, literally just uh, my brother. I got a younger brother. Um, we lived on 25 acres, sort of a little bit out of town. So we, we just hang out on the farm uh, as kids. We rode horses, motorbikes, just sort of – we're just little larrikin, larrikin kids. Yeah. Um, mum and dad at home as well. And, yeah, that's that's pretty well. Polo cross, played football, heap of sports and, yeah, played stayed pretty structured in our childhood and, yeah, had a pretty strict childhood as well. Pretty close yeah. to your brother? Yeah, very close to my brother. Yeah. Um, Parents? Yeah, very close to mum and dad as Even well. Even though they were strict? Um, yeah, they were very, mum especially. Uh, yeah. Shout out. Um, shout out, mum. Yeah, shout out, mum. Thanks. Um, yeah, very strict and um, it's amazing um, the bond we have and, and it's, even, it's stronger than ever now as well. Brilliant. So, yeah, fantastic. Yeah, nice, Looking mate. forward to hearing more about yeah. why that bond's so strong yeah, yeah. as we un- unpack that. So, um, so talk us through, obviously, you work. What do you do for work? I work in civil construction. I Great. work for a Melbourne company, uh, Delta Group, um, and I've worked for them for 10 or 11 years. Okay. And yeah, just uh, yeah, that's that's what I do for work. <laughs> just, yeah, just, pr- pretty just well. Bu- There's, building the city, it's mate. Just, uh, yeah, cool. yeah, yeah, pretty not, much. Not a, not a big, <laughs> not a big deal. <laughs> it's uh, it pays the bills. Now, Joshy, we're not going to beat around the bush here. Um, as as you know, the podcast is called Talking Tough, yep. and and we're going to get straight to it. And we want to know, we want to hear from you. In your life, tell us about when shit hit the fan. <laughs> shit, shit hit the fan. Um, when I was about. Realistically, it hit, hit the fan when I was about 20, uh, uh, sorry, 26. And it really all come to the surface at 28 when I actually um, realised that ignoring the problem uh, had gone too far. So I just had a, a small lump on one of my nuts. I'm going to say nuts. Um, yeah. so it's that's what they nuts. are. Yeah, that's, that's what they are. We've got lots of different <laughs> ways we say them. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, and I had a little lump appear on, on, one of, on my right nut and I just ignored it, thought it was possibly from riding uh, horses in my childhood, um, I tri- I'm a triathlete now, so a lot of bike riding and fitness work there and I just thought maybe it was caused by the bike. It didn't yeah. hurt and I was training pretty hard at the time working but big hours. But just noticeable. Yeah, it was noticeable and I could feel it and it, it was nothing. Um, and then, yeah, two years or 18 months to two years down the track, this lump grew a little bit and it started to hurt and being that, you know, tough, uh, it'll be right until it got pretty well unbearable. And mm. that was when I thought oh, I better get this ch- uh, checked out, and that's so when it I literally st- got to a point where it was so painful. Yeah, and that's the point you said I better get this checked yeah, out. Yeah, pretty it much. Was, it was just, but yeah. it built up to that point. Yeah, pretty well. Uh, yeah, right. I got it. It pretty much went from not hurting to not hurting a little bit, and then hurting. It just went from not hurting to bang. Oh, so it's yeah, yeah. straight so away. So was bang. it like being hit in the nuts with a cricket ball? It was just a like, what was, sort of pain are we talking? It was just a dull ache, yeah. um, it, and it was you could know like a toothache. But every mm. time your pants brushed against the, the nether regions, it, it hurt. <laughs> the, family mm. it, the family jewels. The family jewels. <laughs> so what did <laughs> you do? I, um, I finished well, I very rarely finished work early at that stage because, you know, that's what you do. Tough is working back hours, long, long hours, you know, yeah, just keeping busy. And um, finished work, went to the doctors. I was lucky enough that he referred me to an ultrasound and that there was an opening the night and that night and there was an ultrasound uh, clinic was next door. So I went straight in, just not thinking much of it, to be honest. Like, I'm pretty blasé, pretty easy going. And um, so they they did this procedure and, and there was no – I'm pretty sure that – I don't know what they're called, but technicians, they can't give much away. But he just said to me, Josh, no work tomorrow. You've got to go get these results first, first thing tomorrow morning. And 
And that was that was pretty well lit. I remember that was the first time I panicked a little bit and thought, all right, this. So is that is that sort of like the tech? And that's, you said a technician, so well, not, the, yeah, not the ultrasound. The yeah, the ultrasound. So, like so you you got a gut feeling that he'd seen something that yeah. you need to take seriously. Because normally, if you like, I've had um, ultrasounds on ankles yeah. and other things, and it's just all right. Your doctor three days time, and then you'll get your results. You know, mm. but I guess if they see anything that's sort of a, a red alert or high risk, then yeah. they're gonna. Say hey, walk in. So now. you were pretty alarmed by his response to it. Um, I'm still a very blase person, and because <laughs> <laughs> because uh, so you I, went straight to the pub. I, no, I don't go to the pub. <laughs> I was actually I'm heavy in training, and I'd just come off a, a pretty good race um, in Shepparton at the time, and I was like, all right, this is really cool. No work tomorrow. Yeah. Went uh, booked the appointment. I got an appointment at um, nine a.m. Uh, so I was you know seven o'clock at the pool and and back into it and thought yep. this I'm going to utilize this day and. Yeah. <laughs> And then it all come crashing down pretty quickly. So I went to the went to the doctors, walked in, and and I can still yeah clearly picture my doctor his face when he just said, mate, the, sorry to save that lump. We're pretty sure it's ninety percent sure it's cancer, um, being wow. testicular cancer. So that was that was really confronting. I actually get goosebumps saying it, but it was really confronting because you just you hear all these stories about other people getting these things that mm. the news told to them, but you never think it could happen to you. And then when you the reality kicks in when you you know I didn't ring my fiance at the time because I was going home to see her she was working from mm. home um, but ringing my brother on the way home just sort of telling him and that's when it sort of sunk in because you're like yeah you've this is a real verbalized it yeah this is a real life thing and it's happening to me and I actually don't know what's next so you without getting too much information told to you you know your life's just immediately being thrown in the air. Mm. And was it sort of a situation where you've heard the word cancer and then nothing sort of registered following that? You just sort of what, – what sort of feelings were going through your mind? Yeah, it was just empty. Like you you just sort of – I still didn't know what was going on. And at the end of the mm. day, you hear all these really crazy cancer stories and you just – they're still – you're still in denial that it's happening to you. Of course. So you just – I was just waiting for the, the next – part of my story to be told from the professionals really. Mm, so. Okay. I can 100% relate. I still remember that apparently the doctor, when he told me that I lost my eyesight, he kept talking for half an hour. I did not hear a word he said. Yeah. Like uh, mum says that he was great and he talked us through this and that and this and that. I was just like you said, mate, numb. I yeah. did not hear another word he said after that, you will be blind for life, which would be similar to hearing those words cancer. Yeah. I, I, yeah. Well, can, can definitely relate. I think I, I think as well when they say I'm a bloke that's just full of positivity mm. um, and when he said 90% it was like, oh, well, he's wrong. There's a 10% chance yeah. I'm pretty good here. Seen the upside. Yeah, so it's always like, no, nah, I'm good. They're all right. So um, we ended up going to uh, Peter Mac, got mm-hmm. referred to Peter Mac and that was when we, yeah, met the oncologist. Like when you walk into a cancer hospital for the first time, it's – a pretty surreal experience and that's when your mind goes into panic a little bit. Mm. You think of – then you go back to the 90% chance that you're going to join these people. Because mm. um, what, what are you seeing in there? You're like, just seeing f- really fragile people, people with no hair, they're white as ghosts, they're, they're looking incredibly ill. Yep. And some of them are, uh, you know, 18 years old. You think that, could be, that could be me soon? It could be me. And mm. that's when you're sort of just thinking, wow. sitting there going, wow, this is – that's where it becomes real. Mm. So and so you you obviously you, you're at Peter Mac. You're you're in wonderful care. Um and and you go to uh, you, you get some more news. And what is that when you finally realise? Okay, well, you're yeah. pretty certain. And, and what 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 happened then? Yeah. So um, went and met my oncologist. So Peter Mac. First of all, shout out to them because insane, incredible hospital mm. uh, organisation. They're just it's great to them the way they deal with everything. Um, so met my oncologist. Um, and then told me that they had to redo the ultrasound. Surprise, Ben. So we had to do two ultrasounds. <laughs> um, was it Ben's mate? No, no, no. Another massage. So another massage to the, to the old um, family jewels. And then um, MRIs to they, – yeah. they informed that they've got to make sure that, first of all, they're going to do the test to confirm it is cancer and that comes um, with a few other tests. But they want to make sure that if it is, it hasn't spread to other parts of your body. Okay. Mm. And, um, yeah, in that – it was honestly as casual as all hell. My oncologist just, just goes to me, Josh, I've shuffled some appointments and it, oh, this was a Wednesday and on the Friday, so in two days' time, we're going to remove your right nut. And it's like... Straight away. Straight away. After he got the MRI results. No, so they haven't... Even before. Even before. So it's just like I'm doing all these tests that So they day, don't even know if it's cancer yet. They don't even know. And so they why just is go, he so adamant that he wants to uh, Because operate. this is a really interesting part. They say that you're two uh, nuts, they talk to each other. Okay. And one bad nut means that there's two bad nuts. 
Right. So they don't know what that is, but a mass on your testy, that's no good. That's unhealthy. We're going to get rid of it straight away. Mm -hmm. And you can still, you know, be fertile or, yeah, have kids with one nut. It's just there's no positive news to come out of, yeah, keeping two. So, yeah, that was when I went, you know, I just felt sick. And, and I, I'd imagine obviously young man, you've got a fiancé, um, you're sitting there and being told this news and then your mind might, you know, move forward and say, well, what if I, you know, if I want to be a father, you know, yeah. what does that entail? So is that, is that sort of a conversation you had to have straight, you know, right then and there? Like, Well, it, it was because we asked these questions to the oncologist yeah. immediately and he just said, look, it's not, yeah, truth be told right now because they talk to each other, you two nuts, that probably both of them are bad at mm. the moment. Mm -hmm. um, and they said taking one out, you, the, plenty of uh, people have had children with just one one testy. So okay. that wasn't an issue. I just more was going uh, into triathlon, my racing. Would I still so be more, fast, strong? Yeah. What about work, lifting things? You know, do you change? Do you lose? You know, there was a lot of endless questions that probably had very simple answers, but mm. just something you just think far out, you know, God. in the yeah. unknown. Before we go into that 48 hours, because obviously that's going to be huge, I need to clear something up from my own personal interest. <laughs> yep. Is it testy or testicle? Because I grew up thinking it was testicle. Yeah. Well, I've gone to – I've done a lot of like reading and writing on it, on, you know, what's happened to me in the past. And every time I write testicle, it comes up with a rig, uh, little red squiggly line on Microsoft Word. And yeah. you write testy and it's good. And I've so you're saying it up, testicle's not a word? I don't think it's a word. And then it's weird because it's testicular cancer, but yeah. So testicle, I that don't think it's a word. Blows my whole childhood yeah. out the window. So what you hit, get hit in the testicles? It's like I think it's like tentacles on an octopus. Or, or <laughs> jelly, I don't know. I don't know. So testes is the right word, or testy, testy. testes, yeah. and then testicular. Yeah, and I don't think testicles is a. I don't. All right. Don't well, thank that. you for clearing that, that up. Clear that, that up. Um, yeah, like I'm I said, the ruins, last my, person. ruins my childhood and all the jokes that I made about my testicles. In saying that, I'll put a little star at asterisk at the bottom of that. I'm the last person you want me teaching you English. <laughs> so, <laughs> all right. Right, so, I'll, I'll, I'll keep that asterisk yeah. there. I'll, yeah. go, I'll go and write it in myself and see how it looks. So 48 hours must have felt like 48 years. Right? Um, to be honest, I think it was a bit of a whirlwind. Like next okay. thing I know, I'm, um, I'm, I'm in there and it's – you're under anesthetic and you're under and you wake up and you've you've got one nut so it's it was that quick and then it was all right well that that was a good enough scare within you know this cancer journey they fixed it it's done, and then you thought healed. you were just going to be okay off to recovery uh get my pants back on and off yeah. i go yeah, yeah know, pretty pretty, into life, pretty right? literally pretty well like that it was they they had all those res uh, tests that they'd done yeah. previously yeah. um and then it was two weeks to let the cut heal now, a little thing that everyone's blown by, when they take out a nut, they don't actually cut open your ball bag. You know Hang that? on. Yeah, here we go. What do you mean? Where do they go through? So they cut above so in your groin just to below your abdominals and pop it up and take it out. Now, I'd hate to... Oh. Yeah. So it, was actually, but it actually made What's me happier. What's the reason for that? Like is it just doesn't heal well on the old yeah, scrotum? Yeah, I don't know. What's... But when I woke up and felt that the cut was there and not yeah. down on the old fella, I They're was – like they've missed. Yeah, I was, I was actually wrapped. <laughs> First yeah. of all, I had to make sure they got the right one. <laughs> but, um, oh, yeah, yeah, so that was a very interesting thing. That a lot of people go, oh, imagine that. But I remember yeah. actually this is a really a side, side note here. I remember watching an episode of Bondi Vet once. <laughs> There's a bloke, right? <laughs> Wait, there's here we go. There's a bloke, right? And he owns he owned a um I don't know it was a it was a bulldog I think anyway he lived in Bondi owned a bulldog, and uh, he was getting a bit randy and, and rowdy and and they had to get rid of his nuts so the guy actually got them to take out the nuts. He goes, I'm only going to let you take his testes out if you put prosthetic testes in, right, which is kind of relevant <laughs> yeah. though. So then yeah. they, they, they snipped them open, they took out this dog's nuts and they put two balls in so they were still hanging out in the back because <laughs> the guy insisted that he wanted a dog with testes, right? That was his thing. <laughs> yeah, right. Like I said, totally a side note. Sorry, sorry to, no, no, sorry no, to no, be thank off you for that. That's great. <laughs> but that's true. But, but that's never a, never a sick situation where you're like, mate, you can take one of my nuts yeah. but you are putting a prosthetic nut in. Did you ever think about that? Well, they did offer. They did offer. They offered to put fair one income. in. Wow. Yeah, fair income. They said, "Do you want a prosthetic nut?" And I said, "Nah, Robbie, Robbie, one nut." They, they wanted that. They <laughs> <laughs> so just had a, a ring to it straight away. So yeah, that's Robbie, one nut. He's so Robbie, one nut was born. Yeah. What? Wait, hey. Rob, wait, hang on. What the hell's Robbie nut? One well, nut? I think I think we're across the across the desk, across the mic from Robbie, one nut. But uh, <laughs> mate, there's there's got to be some stuff going on in between the years when the, you're about to have a nut taken out. 
Like there, to me, there's two very different paths you can take. Go down and look at the negative side or, or look at the bright side. Like talk us about the, sort of that mental health side of things when you're going through that. Well, it's just um, control the controllable. Like it's – I find it very – there's a – if you want to go into details of it, there's, you know, a lot of different types of cancers out there and not a lot of them you can feel something and then act on mm. it. So I was so looking at the bright side, fortunate – Found a nut, uh, found a lump on my nut, could remove it. I got a second, get a second chance. A lot of people go through that, having blood cancer, bone cancer, whatever it is. They don't know until it's too late. So whatever, as I said, whatever the professionals say to do, we just go around and oh, I'll just trust them and their mm. judgment, and we and we go from there. Mm. So yeah. what happened next? So two weeks, I had to heal. Um, they then did a biopsy of the affected nut. And um, they did all, all the MRIs, the ultrasounds, everything they'd done. And I had two weeks to recover with the, the cut before I could go back to work and get my results and, and off you go on your merry way. Like I was doing a lot, of, um, <clears throat> a lot of training in that two weeks, upper body strength and swim strength and a lot of walking just to keep active because I was, I was itching to go like it, five days off work was enough and then I was mm. <laughs> ready to go. I was, Going to be crazy, yeah, and it was starting to be COVID as well. So, you know, work was getting a bit hairy. I thought, oh, I've got to keep my job as well and mm. away you go there. So, um, yeah, that, that two-week period ended and my oncologist, as I said, in COVID, ended up on a Zoom telehealth call and, yeah, just confirmed it was cancer. Over Zoom? Yeah, over Zoom. Wow. Just said, yeah, mate, we, we got it out, it was cancer, but the next bombshell was, yeah, it spread. And I was, wow. yeah, like, whoa, it spread. So I had a mass the size of a tennis ball in my stomach, um, some spots on my lymph nodes and spots on my lungs. And the next part he said is you're going to need chemotherapy. And So you're thinking five days off and I'm ready to get back yeah, to it. Yeah, all of a sudden you get chemo itching, on the cards. Absolutely itching. And that was when I was just like, what the hell is chemotherapy? When you like? found out when they had the Zoom call, were you with anyone or were you by just yourself? Just my fiancé, Em. So and how we, did she cope? Yeah, I remember, I remember looking at her and she wasn't in a good way. Mm. And that's when that, I went off her vibes that – yeah, this isn't. Th- good. This is about to go down, and mm. I am I dying? Like, am I actually am I dying now? Like, so that 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 question's going through your head. Yeah. So right now it's like, how? All right, this is really bad now. Like, I thought getting that nut taken out, game f- reset. Thank God I felt it, mm. and finally close, close call. Yeah, finally acted mm. on it, mm. and everyone was just like, "He's going to be right." Way we go back on, you know, back on the triathlon bandwagon, mm. back to work. But righto. All right, now you've got mortgage repayments. You've got. Am I going to keep my job? Mm. I'm going to be off work for how long? You know. So I just had a lot of. Did they sort of paint that out? That picture of what the chemo was going to sort of there was put you through. Two options that they so then um, they confirmed everything like uh, everything that happened, saying chemotherapy and cancer, and then I had to go into um, the cancer hospital to to work out what we're going going to what way we're going to go down. Um, there was two options with the chemotherapy. There was a, a standard, what a standard sort of person goes through, which is just, I can't remember the actual details of it, but it was a, it was about 30 hours of chemotherapy. And then we were pretty much going with that because you don't want chemicals in your system. It can affect fertility. Now I've only got one nut as well. Putting all these chemicals in your system can really affect what you're doing, um, in life. And then... There was another option and it was an extra 20 or 30 hours of chemotherapy um, and they said that – but there'd be uh, no chances of, of skipped apart there. There'd be no chances of lung scarring. In that first option, there was chances of lung scarring. In the second option, they say you're a free diver or a professional athlete. Now I get a lot of my mental health, a lot of um, satisfaction in life out of running, riding, swimming, being active – and I just said to M straight away, I can't lose that. If there's a chance to have, you know, a little bit more chemo but be able to run, ride, swim, do what I love doing, I'm a highly active person, then yep. I want to go down that path. Yeah. But then there was her saying, what about fertility? You're getting more ke- chemicals administered in your system. Yeah, she's you, thinking you, about your future. Yeah, to get future. Mm. And that's – like it's not just a little bit more chemo. Didn't you say the first option was 30 hours? I think it was almost yeah, nearly. Like it's nearly double in it. Nearly double. Don't don't quote me on that, but it was a hell of a. And lot it's not more. all just bang 30, 30 hours of chemo. It's like it was an extra. They space it out. out they yeah. spread it out, and you're feeling like yep. rubbish for a long time. So an yep. extra thirty is nothing to be sneezed at. Yeah. Well, they 
they, it was described to me as well is that the first one was three rounds, the second option was four rounds and he said, by the fourth round of this one, mate, yeah, you'll be you're going to know about it. Yeah. So I don't know if that's to sort of persuade you to go the first one but... Um, so was there a conversation, obviously you've spoken a lot since we've been chatting, you've spoken yep. a lot about, you know, having a family, it's obviously something you wanted to do. Was there a conversation about potentially before all of the chemo um, because I've, as Ben knows and um, probably haven't spoken about it a lot but I've been through IVF because of what I went yep. through, couldn't have uh, kids naturally. Yep. So obviously um, had to get a little bit of help and yep. it involved <laughs> – I don't want to bring my own nut story into this. Yeah. Uh, but it involved, this podcast is going down. Going down so yeah, bring it on. Well, uh, yeah. But it involved me going under and then they inject a big needle into your nuts and they pull yeah. out what they call yeah. young sperm and then we've managed to have a beautiful yeah. little boy from Amazing. it and everything. But, but prior, obviously in this situation – was that something that they talked you through and say, hey, listen, what about if we take a sample? Because yeah. that's what I'm straight away, my mind's going there. Yeah. I'm going, okay, well, Josh has got, before all the chemo, can, yeah. can he freeze yeah. uh, sperm and then uh, look at look at um, having some intervention down the track and, and having, you know, a baby another way? Yeah, so we, we then had, um, they wanted to start the chemo pretty quickly. Yeah. So okay. in between, we pretty much had, I think it was about seven days to freeze as much as we could. Because there was no guarantee that that last healthy nut was going to come back healthy, yep. um, or if it was unhealthy, and they wanted to do a few tests as well to see what it was like. So, yeah, there was constant, like every second or third day, I think it was. Um, and it's, there's actually a funny story in that because I actually recall um, the first appointment to do with my cancer that M, my fiance at the time, she's my wife now, didn't attend with me was my first um, appointment to go to the. Go to the room donation. and do the thing, donation. Yeah. Yeah. And I remember she goes, you'll be all right, you'll be by yourself, you'll be all right. And I'm like, mate, I'm sweet. So I remember that morning <laughs> I went down, at, at, um, I looked at the, re- the referral and it had, you know, Royal Women's Hospital, blah, 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 that's all good, sweet. I'm going to do an ocean swim before I go. My, and I read yeah. up, you know, the Rev cold water, up. Rev, revs him up. I thought, you beauty. Anyway, I did that. I mm. drive down to the Royal Women's. I'm sitting in the waiting room, grab a number. I'm sitting there for about 15, 20 mm. minutes. Like, Jesus, they're running a bit behind here and there's yeah. no men walking in. They're all women pregnant and... I go up and say, look, I'm just here to do a bit of a donation. She goes, no, 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 that's about two k's away. <laughs> oh, <laughs> you're in the wrong hospital. <laughs> so in the wrong hospital. So I've gone. Oh. Went for another run. Yeah. So I went for a run. I rock up to the donation place, sweating bullets. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Woven my head, and yeah, you know, I went. So I'm remembering an Amsterdam. If you've if you've damaged that sample, and <laughs> oh, <laughs> by you know, running, yeah, by running and sweaty, and I left you for five minutes. So that was oh, a funny. that was a funny little story to come off that, but um. Yeah, he gave a heap of, like did a few donations as much as I could and then, then away we went into the, into yep. the treatment. Yeah, far yeah. out. So talk to us. What happened next? Well, yeah, it's pretty gloom, doom and gloom, isn't it? Like there's not um, – what do you do? Like yeah, you're, look, you're just sort of sitting there your, your whole life. You Well, for the last four years I'd been striving to be the best triathlete, best pu- uh, human pretty well that I could be healthy, fit, race, mm. work and now I'm going to be stuck. So – I left a little part out with that chemotherapy. That was, we went the second option Mm. and that was going to be one week on. So a full eight hours in the chair uh, for a full five days and then two weeks off to recover and that four times. So pretty well, they said, you're just going to deteriorate down to nothing and then that's it. So reality is you you put all that work in and it's all going to be thrown out the window pretty quickly. How did that make you feel? Um, pretty terrible. Yeah. Pretty well, what, what, what's I've going on? What's that voice inside your some. head telling you? It's Well, to be honest, my voice, uh, my little voice, as I said before, holding on to that 10% hope that it's okay. It was the first mm. thought was, right, I, how can we make this positive? Mm. And, you know, my life, the reality is you could die. Mm. Like you, you die, you're, you're in alive, you're a dead man walking. So how can I make it, how can I make this um, – this a positive and that was I just want to motivate and inspire others that mm. even no matter how you're feeling on the day, you can turn up and, and be your best. So I decided I was going to train through my whole treatment and then I wanted to Jeez. just complete a race in triathlon, just a short distance race. Didn't know if it could be possible mm. but complete a race in the same year that I was diagnosed with testicular cancer. And did you lose a lot of weight? I put on. You put on weight. Put on a lot of weight. Um, I don't know whether it was just all the chemicals and um, just the bloating of the yeah. chemicals. But, um, yeah, it was, yeah, pretty – just put on probably 10 or 15 kilos. Okay. So that blows my mind to think that you've gone, right, I'm going through all this, I'm facing 12 weeks of chemo and in that you've somehow found the, the mindset or the made the choice and the decision to go – 
I'm going to try and focus on a positive. I'm going to set myself a goal of, of running in this race, like, which hats off to you. I've got two questions here. Let's start with the first. Why do you think you went that way? Because so many other people would be focusing on all of the negatives in that situation because there is so many of them. Uh, it's, a, it's a great question, but uh, it's, it's out of your control. And I just... If I had a, like, don't, don't get me wrong, there was times where you were just, uh, you didn't want to do anything. But when you, it's like, it's a, I don't know how to answer it. It's, you could lie in bed and mope around, but time still goes on. And I just find that uh, moving is the body's medicine. So mm, by moving, you know, it can just, you just keep the blood flowing. You're walking the dogs. If you lie on the couch and to be honest, you, you, so that was early days in, deciding I was going to do that and that the main motive was just to, to show any everyone that anything's possible but as I started getting treatment movement actually made the feeling of chemotherapy disappear even wow. yeah even though I would run out of energy really quickly you would feel really crappy and then as soon as you got up got moving whether it was a walk a light little spin on the bike I have an feel indoor better. bike it would feel good. It was like the light, the weight was lifted off your shoulders. Amazing. So it did help as well, which gave me extra bit of motivation because I'd felt that feeling. And so when you finish your treatment, uh, obviously there must be a time when you go and you get retested. Yep. Uh, tell us about that. Um, yeah, it was actually the first time I would experience having PTSD. Um, right. Yeah, I'd never thought much of it. You know, everything went pretty well uh, during uh, chemo and then post chemo, but going back to that hospital for the first time, and I remember passing the car park, which I used to leave, and I went into utter shock. Mm. I remember thinking, I, I don't want to go in here. And I remember ringing my wife, Em, and thinking, I'm actually, my heart rate picked up, started sweating just because my body had been in there and hurt so much mm. in the hospital. And mm. yeah, so. Where you were receiving the chemo? Yeah. yeah. So that's where I go to get the checkups um, post now. So. How long post finishing chemo were you back for the first checkup? Um, I'm pretty sure it was three months. Yeah, right. Pretty and sure. you, you've mentioned sort of experiencing that feeling of PTSD. Can you take us a little bit deeper into that? Like, well, we what, what did it feel like? What was going through your head? Well, I'm, I'm as you know, pretty bubbly guy, um, pretty cruisy. And yeah, I was just, you know, in the hospital ready to, I was just excited to see some of the nurses who I'd made a bit of a relationship with mm. and, you know, to see the people, maybe see my oncologist and whatever. And then to just go, well, and be just nearly go into shock. Mm. It's just like, whoa, all right, I'm not used to these feelings. It was just panic. And I think it was just, as I said, from being a little bit hurt and the body going, I don't want to, we're going in here for a reason, you know, and, and it was just that. So it just was a, a pretty horrible feeling. I yeah. still get it to this day going in there now. Yeah. yeah but it is, there's a positive to take out of that, that every time I go into Peter Mac, you just appreciate normal. You appreciate yeah. Life. If you've had a bad day at work, nothing's as bad as going into that hospital again and you just yep. think about how much worse your situation could be. Yeah, for sure. So tell us about that, that day and that feeling from a sort of a mindset point of view of when you did finally get some better news. What was that like? Yeah, so um, towards, yeah, I, was, I went away with them. I was actually so, I think I had about, from the last cycle of chemotherapy, we had about, six weeks I think it was to to start regaining gaining strength because by the end of cycle four you're you're not good it's not a nice feeling it was pretty horrible and lucky enough my my um, partner family they have a, a place in Inverloch so I used to go up there and just ride the bike in the hills and go right. for runs and just it was what I would call coming from ground zero to try build back up to be the best athlete and healthiest version of myself I could be again mm. and I remember just, yeah, we got the call. Um, we got a Zoom. We went on Zoom and, and got the call and that was just the biggest weight. Oh, it'll be a day I'll never forget. It was the biggest weight lifted off my shoulders um, to know that after living life in the slow lane, it was time to really, yep. yeah, the handcuffs were off. We'll, yeah, one so you nut got, you was got the all clear. Got the all clear to That's say. That's amazing. The, believe it or not, the mass was still in the stomach but it okay. was a, a lot smaller and a, it was the size of a ping pong ball or, or just under the size of a ping pong ball which but meant it that it's, not, only it it's only scar tissue. It's only scar tissue. Yeah, okay. so they said the body will clear that out. And so green light to get back into fitness. Pretty much everything. And, and go, go on, on yeah. with your life. Yeah, and which was a pretty amazing, amazing feeling. So oh, That's pretty cool. How did them yeah. feel, mate? Yeah, she, it was just a, just a weight lifted off her shoulders as well. And yeah, because she, she's been through everything with you, right. And, you that's, know, and your family. 
Yeah, a lot, like especially with COVID, M saw everything. Mm. Uh, my brother and M were there uh, a lot. Mum and dad were in New South Wales, which mm-hmm. now, now since then have moved into Victoria. Okay. Um, but, yeah, th- a lot of people talk about myself um, and me going through it, but you, the, the person caring for the cancer patient, mm. it's horrible. Huge. Yeah. It's huge. There's times where, you know, I'm a closed book as well sometimes, mm-hmm. which goes into we can talk about um i'll go into that in a second but i'm a closed book and i sort of get up and i grunt like my spine wouldn't straighten up or i was really sore and she she would cry and be like are you all right yeah i'm good and that goes into we us talking about being tough is i didn't realize how fragile i was until i got through chemotherapy mm. until i'm here now i go man that was that was really bad mm. now mm. that goes into another point like do we do we say we're okay because we need to get through something, we need to tell ourselves, like this is just a, it's a question I'm asking you boys as well. Like I was like, I'm good. Yeah, I'm good. Everyone asked me, oh, how's things? Yeah, mm. I'm good. Really, I wasn't. But was Sometimes I telling Sometimes you myself, get sick of answering it though, don't you? You do as well. Like, it's like, man, I'm going through chemotherapy. What do you <laughs> what reckon? What do you reckon? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It's not, it's not rocket science. Um, but yeah, the, the further I've got away from chemo, and especially on the one year anniversary of, you know, reflecting, I realised how how fragile and vulnerable I was. Mm. And I just thought to myself, why, why didn't I show some of that? It's actually a question I've asked myself. Mm. So, do you, do you wish you did? Um, that's a great question. Um, that's what I'm here for, mate, the hard hit. Yeah, questions. the hard ones. <laughs> <laughs> Look, I, I'm, a, I'm the sort of guy that does try to march on, but since, since probably not during the time of – having chemo if I went back through it again yeah maybe I would be a lot more in tune with the way I would respond to it and Mm. show my emotion because since chemotherapy and my cancer journey I'm so intact with my emotion if I don't want to do something I'll say it if I don't feel comfortable with something I'll say it if I don't like someone's comment I'll say it if I'm sad I'll say it Mm. life is about how you feel Mm. and I just know that my health and everything else comes first and I guess that just goes to back at what we were saying at the start. It's not about how tough you are or if you're sick, you march on. If, if you're not okay, go and look after yourself because mm. your health and, and your own personal well-being is, is number one at the most. And once you lose that, you, you, firsthand you, you, you experience it. Absolutely. And so now you've got the green light. Tell us, um, you know, what sort of goals did you have? Did you obviously want to get back to triathlons? Um, is that something that, that you were able to do? Yeah, so it was actually a real – there's another story involved in that. So I ended up training. I didn't train every day. Uh, it's a little thing that I – it was out of my control. On the last two Sundays of cycle three and four, I got up and went for a little walk, but I couldn't class that as training. But that were the two days that I just couldn't – My body, like out of 12 weeks. Out of 12 weeks. <laughs> it was, oh, yeah. It's not bad, mate. <laughs> yeah. Just give M, yourself a break. M would have to literally get my legs out of bed – Help me up, get me moving. As soon as I took my first few steps, I was right to start walking again. But those days I just couldn't Weakness. pull myself together. It was just yeah. that week. Yeah. Um, but, uh, yeah, I completed my first race back in the same year as being uh, diagnosed. Amazing. Um, and, yeah, it, was just, it just shows you can do anything. And it, it comes with the support of your family, your friends. And Where was that, Josh? Where'd that you... was in St Kilda in the 2XU Amazing. short distance triathlon series. But my brother, um, I don't know if, you, if I'm going off tangent here and tell me if I am, but... Mate, you, you keep talking. That's my brother just showed all about um, just trying to set an example and and bring awareness to cancer and health. And he said to me halfway through the treatment that he, he, like he's a football player as well, never done triathlon. He was going to do a full distance Ironman to raise money and awareness for testicular cancer. Um and you pretty much laugh at him. You think, mate? Yeah, surely not. No, well, hey, for the, for I don't even know if I know full <laughs> Ironman. What's involved? Uh, Three point eight kilometer ocean swim. Yep. One hundred and eighty kilometer bike ride and a forty two point two kilometer marathon to finish. Oh, Is so, that all? So yeah, no, that's nothing it. much. N- nothing much after that. <laughs> Um, yeah, right. So I was sort of – I'd done one just as a bit of fun in the past. Um, just for a bit of fun. I got dead. To just do a lazy Sunday. Sunday. You got dead to do it and you thought you'd do it. Yeah. And it's a so real culture, it. isn't it? Because my brother-in-law, uh, he's from America. He's one of the fittest guys I know and he really struggled. He trained his butt off and did Bustleton. Yeah, yeah. And went over there and we went over there to support him and um, – they have the carb loading night before in the yeah. big tent with everyone like that. But there are some hardcore people yeah. involved in Ironmans. I remember one particular guy had like a big reputation and I think he had – what is it? what's the order? It goes swim. Swim, bike, run. So he went swim, bike and then he got to the run, this guy, and he was a professional triathlete, Ironman. And um, I think it was 5Ks into the run he, he 
totally ripped his calf off the bone. Yeah. And he finished. Yeah. So he refused to stop yeah. and pull out. Like he was really bad injury but he managed to do the rest of the yeah. 42 Ks. I think he just walked it because yeah. it was just about a pride thing. There's some it's, pretty dedicated um, people just like yourself. I don't want to – yeah, well, I just completed Port Mac three weeks ago and Amazing. tore a tendon in my foot at kilometre 20 of the run and, and hobbled. Mum was crying saying just just stop, just finish and <laughs> – and we're saying to her, he's not going to stop. <laughs> so, <laughs> she um, knows you too well. I got there. It was Amazing. it was a demoralising feeling. It was shattering. You put so much work into it. But we just hold pride and we work so hard to get there. Yeah. Um, so you've got to get it done. I think it's just a part of it is just getting to the finish line. You learn that after when you don't get your expectation of the race, you, you work out that you're just there to complete it and reach a goal. Well done What's, for finishing, yeah. man. That's, that's massive. Yeah, 100%. What is the aftermath like? Like... Whether it's the whether it was the first short race or think about the one that you've just recently done, like from what you're saying, you're training every day. Like obviously you're working as well, but you're training every day. Obviously putting so much time and energy into it. What happens after you cross the finish line? Because that's a whole lot of training and work. Like how long goes into it? How much prep? And then what's the aftermath like? It's it's the well, come down in a way. It's literally. Um, <laughs> You have a whole lot. I'll go into it. Like you learn the first thing about. I'll give you a serious answer and then a bit of a funny one. You will, you learn that life's all about the journey. It's not about the cherry on top, which is crossing the finish line of the Ironman. Mm. Like in that story, I was going to say before, with my brother and I, we were doing the Ironman training together. He wanted to do the Ironman. We learned that the journey of doing that training for the Ironman together was so special. Like, almost like it was uh, certainly life changing. That. The Ironman itself is such a special day. It's just a cherry on top. You can take that into your life, everyday, everyday life. It's the process. Mm. Uh, enjoy the process and then the rest will come. Yeah, for sure. Unreal, mate. You've, um, you've been so honest. Um, it's been great having a chat with you and, and the way that you tell it. Um, I think that you probably under, under sort of sell how hard it must have been to go through what you went through. Um, we've got a couple of quick fire questions, don't we, Ben? Yeah, yeah right. absolutely. I reckon we're going to throw some stuff at you. Just really yep. easy, quick answers. I'll so, go the first one. Yeah, go for it. <laughs> you ready? Yep, ready. Snitty or snake or steak? Snitty. Nice. Where do you go to switch off, mate? Um, to my bike. Best place to go for a yarn with a mate? Golf course. Oh, golf. Oh, man, yeah. There you go. Where do you <laughs> play golf? Uh, just the local, local local little course, yeah. Fantastic. What's the worst advice you've ever got when it comes to your mental health? Get over it, I reckon. Yeah, get yeah, over move it. Move on. <laughs> get over it. Yeah. yeah. Best advice? It's the tale of two mounds. You, you, first, you, you get two lives. Your second, second life begins when you realise you've only got one life. Is that the quote? I think it's from That'll do. Tale that of two mountains. Good to me. What is next? What is next in, in your life? What are you working on? Um, I know you've told me about turn up. Tell us about that. What's what's the future hold? What's it got in store? Well, just trying to to share my story um, about advocating for your health and and you know living your best life. So turn up. I'm trying to just go around speaking to different companies or organisations, just sharing my story um, and trying if I can rub off just a few lessons of what I learned during chemo without someone having to go through chemo. Well, and go through a cancer journey. Well, then. That's just – it would be one of the greatest gifts that cancer has given to me is to share that experience with other people um, to appreciate their life. Well, How would you come up with turn up? Turn up because that's how simple it is. All you had to do each day was turn up. Like people think about it, just do it and that's Nike, do it. Um, but it's quite simple. Wake up. If you've got something planned from the night before like a exercise or whatever it is, just – Wake up. No one wants to get up out of bed and do it. But to turn up and do it as soon as you're in that, done your first rep at the gym or done your first five minutes of run or grateful the ride. Grateful for it. You're grateful for it mm. and, and your blood's flowing you're ready to go. So turn up. It, it is that simple. Don't complicate it. Um, and you, you, I guarantee you endorphins are going at the end of it and you'll be feeling as good as gold. So that's where turn up comes from and hopefully there's an exciting future within it. Yeah, so, fantastic, mate. And yeah. personal life, just quickly, you've got your – 
was your fiance now your beautiful yeah. wife em what's wife. uh what's plans for the future um plans for the future so married now and uh we went from robbie one night to powerball because naturally you can see <laughs> so oh congratulations yeah which was a big shock to the system that's that amazing. Is fantastic we that's got told it would be news. yeah we got told it would be powerball, really, uh, yeah, powerball. did you get a powerball ticket that night <laughs> yeah, <laughs> sort of. so one of my mates come up with that name and <laughs> yeah i thought i'm gonna take that oh it's so good um so yeah we got told there was zero to no chance so that's another little lesson learned just run your own race yeah um do the right things and and you don't know what your chances are so congratulations very lucky and looking that's, forward to the future with yeah, within that as well amazing. Mate, how, how yeah. far along is she 21 weeks oh that's awesome yeah so well hopefully all goes smooth so you realize you're just realizing the small things of a pregnancy journey how precious life is even mm. after what i've been through you you never truly understand how precious it is knowing what you know now being through what you've been through now what is your definition of tough tough is just being in sync with yourself and others, making, yeah, you only get one life. It's appreciate, appreciate your normality because it's a, it's a superpower really at the end of the day. Um, tough isn't what it used to be. Tough is standing up for what you believe in, um, getting the full potential out of yourself and your body. And I think that's, that's being healthy and, and the best, be, just be the best version of yourself. And we all know, we all know what that is. Thanks so much for listening to today's episode and if it struck a chord, call a mate. And if he doesn't pick up, call Lifeline on 13 11 14. Thanks for tuning in. Everything you've heard in today's episode will be in the show notes below where you click to play this episode. While you're there, why not chuck us a subscribe or follow? Catch you next time.